Jordan and I'm part of the Research Innovation <coughs> Center staff. We are grateful that you've come and spent time with us for this special Heritage Days Meet the Researcher. Um, Dr. Michael Yazimski is going to be here to talk about Mayo's history with military research and then share some of his own regenerative medicine research and um, dealing with wounded servicemen and service women. And my intro is short, so we'll just turn it over to you. And Thank you thanks, for thanks very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to the Research Heritage Days and for coming here in particular. And I've gotten a lot of help already. Thank you for fixing my tie for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I'm away from home and my missus isn't there to help me, I need help. I think. I'd like to acknowledge a few folks. Our members of our lab are here uh, who came to listen. So uh, guys and girls, stand up, let everybody see who you are. These are the people that do all the work. I'm going to... I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I get to show what they do. Um, also, we have uh, our colleagues uh, from the 3D lab. Dr. Matsumoto, are you here? And Dr. Morris? Dr. Matsumoto, I, I'll get to a point where we're going to talk about the three-dimensional fabrication, both for use in the things we put into patients and for use to help uh, we surgeons in the operating room have a better idea what's, what's going on. Dr. Matsumoto will do that. And I'll put a picture in here to, to show that it's uh, time to uh, look at what you do. We'll also put a few military things in. And uh, if anybody has the queasiness, I'll show a few pictures of people that I took care of in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, how they, things we can do here can maybe help uh, what we need to do for those folks. And we have to put disclosures, things that we do that might affect our work. I'll give you a second to read those. And as an outline, we'll talk, uh, we always start, uh, we, hear, we hear about research being bench to bedside. We think of it a little different here. We think of it as bedside to bench and back. We, we start with a clear description of an unmet need for patients. We take that need to the lab, we formulate research questions from that need, then we come back and try to help patients with things that they otherwise might not have a, 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 uh, an option for. And the musculoskeletal, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so we work on musculoskeletal things, bone, cartilage, ligament, muscle, nerve, skin, and composite tissues. We try to start with what do we have available for patients now, what are the current treatment options, and then what are we doing about it in the lab, what might be coming down the road for things that don't really have a good answer. So as I mentioned, we begin with a clear description of an unmet clinical need, articulate the research question based upon that need. And the, the key here is teamwork. We see constant interaction among all the people you see there, researchers, clinicians, regulatory colleagues, industrial colleagues, throughout the process of translation of patient care. And we often joke, I, I just came from the Conflict of Interest Review Board where we talk about interactions of our staff here with industry. And I, I joke about it, if we're gonna take a tumor out of somebody tomorrow and put them back together after we cut it out, I can't go home in my garage tonight and, and build the tools I'm going to need and the implants I'm going to need to put them back together. We must work with industry. There are certain bounds that we have to stay away from. Uh, we, we recognize that our industry colleagues have a fiducial responsibility to their shareholders. We have a responsibility within the patient care, patient-physician relationship. We just have to keep those two things in mind when we work with industry. But we need to work together. We can't uh, work in a vacuum. Now let's talk about errors. Orthopedic surgery has had a few errors. Uh, resection, fusion, replacement, and, re and now coming upon regeneration. Uh, it used to be that if a joint was bad back in the early days of uh, anesthesia and surgery in the uh, mid to late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, if the patient couldn't take it anymore, we would cut the joint out. Uh, the pain reliably went away, but what did they lose? They, they lost some stability. They'd still have some motion. They'd lo lose stability, had a little more time walking, say, for example, if it was a hip. Uh, but that was the best we could do. Then we transitioned into an era of fusion. We'd cut the joint out and we'd fuse the bones across where the joint used to be. Uh, that took care of the floppiness. That gave them a real strong leg or a leg to walk on. But they, the, what they paid for it was motion. They had a hip, for example, that was in a given position and couldn't move. Then in about the late 1950s, early 1960s, we went to an era of replacement. We'd still cut the hip out if it was diseased but we put a metal and plastic hip in. 
Uh, and we're kind of transitioning now into an area of regeneration. Uh, don't cut the hip out, but let's rebuild the bone and cartilage that needs to happen to make the joint normal again. We're, we're, few things are coming into clinical use already, and we'll go over a few of them. So here's the first artificial hip done in these United States under FDA approval, done by our chairman, Mark Coventry, here in, 1960, in March of 1969. Uh, we've come a long way since then, but how, how did it get to that? This is the fellow from England, John Charnley, who came up with it. And the reason I show on the left the metal and the two different plastic cups, uh, the metal is still kind of sort of the same. It's still metal. It's a metal alloy these days. That was stainless steel back then. But the cup he used, uh, he started out with a Teflon cup. They had some good animal experimentation that showed that that was okay. And pretty much 100% of them failed very rapidly when he put them in humans. Uh, they went to a polyethylene cup, and that's pretty much what we use today. So the, the message there is no matter how hard we do things in animals, how many times we do in animals and it works, when it goes into a human being, it's different. Uh, we need to expect that it'll be somewhat different. Uh, and we need to have equipoise when we do something new in a person. That is, we don't ever experiment on people. We have to present people something where we say, here are the possible pluses and minuses, and do you think it's better than what you got right now? And is it better than the current tr best treatment we have? Uh, and if they think there's a good balance of that, plus and minus, then we'll offer them the new treatment. Uh, but that we have to keep, we have to, remember I said we work within the doctor-patient relationship. We have to keep that uppermost in mind and, and not, oh, let me, you know, let me get this new thing in somebody. We have to say, is there something in it for the person? Is it at a point where we can maybe help them? And they feel it's a good trade-off for getting something that's never been in a person before. So let's talk about bone, the first one. What's current treatment? Autologous graft means something we take out of one part of you and put in another part of you. Uh, it can be structural or trabecular, uh, spongy bone or hard bone, allograft meaning from somebody else. We can get the bone matrix from that bone from somebody else, which has all the signaling molecules that make bone grow. We can take those growth factors and make them synthetically. Now I'm going to show a couple of my patients. Uh, this is a young man that had a a, a tumor. Uh, I saw him about two weeks ago. He's seven years from this surgery. Uh, but we had to cut out his tailbone, part of his spine, and part of his pelvis to, to really to, to allow him to stay alive. We had to put that back together. Uh, here's what we did. Well, I'll show it up here. We had to connect his spine back to his pelvis. We used the small bones from the leg out here. Uh, to do that. And then we took other bone from persons who had donated it as they donate kidneys and lungs and we held it all together with metal. This little stuff you see in here is metal. He doesn't give up much in the way of most mobility because your, your sacrum doesn't move much between your spine and your pelvis anyway. But he does have paralysis because we had to cut out nerves. So I'll get into nerve regeneration later. So we have certain things we can do. This is, this is the state of bone regeneration now. Uh, so what do we do for bone regeneration? Bone, need, bone cells need something to attach to and, and grow. And that's, we, we make those things, we call them scaffolds. The folks that stood up at the beginning here, the members of the group that work together with me, uh, we make scaffolds. We put cells on them. We need to put molecules on that tell the cells what to do. And those scaffolds need to provide some support to the area while the bone is growing. So this is all about tissue engineering. Cells need a scaffold. Molecules tell the cells what to do. But it's really all about the cells. It's just a really applied cell biology that we do. And the scaffolds, here's our Washington Monument with a scaffold around it while it was being repaired. And it's not, not a whole lot different than trying to repair somebody that is missing bone. We choose polymers. Uh, uh, mostly because of these properties that you see. Metals are okay. Ceramics are okay. Uh, but we can do a lot with polymers by designing the polymers, be making novel chemistry, and putting them together in a variety of ways to make a three-dimensional structure. Uh, now, we got to put a little bit of history in. So this is Mayo history days, heritage days. Here, the, the, the fellow in the middle, William Worrell Mayo, was the first uh, uh, member of the Mayo family to come here in Rochester. So how did he get here? And he uh, was a surgeon in the Union Army. And, during Civil War times, and in 1863 was sent to the Minnesota Territory. Uh, those of you who have uh, military backgrounds, you'll understand why we are here in this very cold northern area. 
He served to the end of the Civil War in 1865, got out of the Army in 1867. Uh, story we hear is that uh, Mrs. Mayo said, we've been following you around in this Army career forever. We finally do not have to move. You're not in the Army anymore. We have a house, the kids are in school, and we're staying right here. Uh, we often joke, couldn't his last military assignment have been in Florida or Texas or somewhere warm? Uh, but uh, there it were, Civil War surgeons, and uh, right there is uh, number 153, William Morrill Mayo. That's how we got here. Okay, now we'll go back to scaffolds. Preformed and injectable, two kind of bone defects. Missing piece of bone, a segmental defect, a hole in a bone, a contained defect. The scaffolds uh, have to be made to address both of those. We either make them preformed or for the contained defect, we can put them in through a needle, minimally, minimally invasive surgery, but they, it's a little bit uh, more difficult from a chemistry uh, perspective, as our chemists will, I think, agree. A little harder to get it so that we get something that we can inject as a liquid, becomes a solid, takes the shape of where we put it, uh, becomes porous and makes bone. Uh, but this, as you'll see, this is a side view of an elderly woman. Uh, Osteoporosis is uh, something that could benefit from an injectable, uh, if you will, signaling cascade that'll make bone. Uh, sometimes elderly women get many of these fractures and get what looks like a hump back. Uh, it'd be hard to operate on each of those vertebrae individually. It wouldn't be hard to inject something that'll make those vertebrae have better bone. And uh, that's the goal of our injectable scaffold program. So what's a scaffold? How do we get the cells to grow in? This is the work of uh, Kiwan Lee, who was one of the graduate students that worked with me here. He's uh, now at the University of Pittsburgh. I asked Kiwan, take uh, from about a half of a millimeter to a millimeter. Let's see how good this uh, instrument is that makes these things. And I'll submit to you, this is pretty good control. A couple tens of microns at each level. We can control the internal porosity pretty, pretty well. Um, this is work of Lee Chun Lu, some scientist that, uh, a senior scientist here, works with me in the lab. We said if we can have those pores, those pores I showed you in the last uh, slide are the black, black spots here. You know, maybe we can put some medicines in the walls of these scaffolds and have them diffuse out in a controlled delivery fashion. Uh, that turned out to be true and we can now do controlled delivery of a sequence of molecules to guide the bone growth from within the scaffolds. And the 3D technologies that uh, Dr. Matsumoto will talk to you about uh, in a few moments, injection molding and uh, the others that you see here. We, use, we pretty much use all of these to make three-dimensional implants. Uh, cells like rough things to grow on. The cells are anchorage dependent. They have to attach to something to do their job. And uh, this is an example of uh, electrospraying. These webs that are made are, are very conducive to cell attachment and cell growth. We also encapsulate molecules that we want to deliver. And we release them from the scaffolds. And, they come out in a controlled fashion rather than all at once is what we want to do, have a steady, steady concentration of them over time. Uh, we also use those molecules in sequence. This is a, a combination of two molecules, one vascular endothelial growth factor that uh, encourages blood vessels to grow because bone cells need blood vessels to supply them with nutrients and take away their wastes. And if we put the vascular endothelial growth factor in first, more blood vessels happen than when we don't. If we follow that with a protein that makes bone happen, more bone forms than does if we do not put those proteins in. Uh, this is a picture of the scaffolds that we make and showing the pores that they have. And one of the 3D mechanisms for making these scaffolds and have the pores come into them. Now let's get back to the military. Uh, this little girl I had the privilege of taking care of in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, during my times in Iraq and Afghanistan, I've been, I've been to the Middle East four or five times altogether, uh, the people who suffer the most are not the combatants. The people who suffer the most are the people that just happen to live there, and there's a war going on and they can't get away from it. Uh, this little girl has uh, benign disease, that big lump on her knee, is not a cancer, it's a benign tumor uh, that unfortunately, the, it destroyed so much bone we couldn't take care of it anymore without removing her leg. But, you know, had she been a little girl here, she'd have said, Daddy, Mommy, my knee hurts, when it was nothing, and we'd have taken care of it with a very small operation. But uh, what we found with, uh, especially in Afghanistan, the people have a very limited access to any medical care at all, uh, and they're very, very primitive indeed. Uh, now, something good. Sometimes good things come out of bad things, and this is a story about the uh, uh, 332nd Air Expeditionary Wing. Uh, uh, these were the Tuskegee Airmen from World War II. 
Uh, during, during my time in Iraq, I was the deputy commander of our theater hospital in Balad, about 40 miles north of Baghdad. Uh, we were the 332nd. We were the reincarnation of this group. Uh, and these were the uh, red tails, they, these P-51 Mustangs that they flew. You know, a lot of the, uh, the bombers that went over Europe in World War II would get uh, at risk of getting shot down by the Germans. And these planes uh, accompanied the bombers to, to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, this was an experiment, uh, uh, of course, that uh, African Americans were not uh, given uh, combat jobs uh, in World War II. They could be uh, helpers, and through the efforts of many people, uh, this experiment showed that not only could they do this, they did it very well. Uh, they had the best, uh, su uh, the, the best success rate for accompanying bombers of any pursuit squadron in World War II. Uh, they, they didn't, anybody who had the red tails uh, did, not lose a, did not lose a plane to Germans. Uh, these old guys came back uh, uh, to uh, Balad to uh, give some support to the troops and uh, uh, that uh, F-16 behind was a little bit different than the plane they flew in 1943, but uh, they, uh, they are still doing good things as old men to, to help the youngsters. So let's go to tendons. Uh, degenerative tendon tears, any of you had a rotator cuff repaired, uh, you understand what that is. Uh, and or anybody who broke your Achilles tendon uh, and had to maybe walk around with one of those little scooters where you put your leg up on it while it heals, uh, knows what that is. The, the issues here are that uh, tendons have junctions. They, they, they hook into the muscles, the musculotendinous junctions, very hard to repair surgically. Uh, they go into bone and ligaments go into bone at both ends. Tendon go into bone at one end and into muscle at the other end. Ligaments go into bone at both ends. Those junctions of tissue to go from a, a soft tissue, a tensile load-bearing tissue like a tendon into a bone or into a muscle are very difficult to take care of surgically and so we're working on those junctions in the lab. And we're working on composite tissues and most people, I think, when this regenerative medicine for musculoskeletal injuries comes to fruition, it won't be, well, we make a bone, we make a tendon, uh, we make some cartilage. We need to make composite tissues that have all of them together. Uh, and the current treatment options are basically to sew them together and hope that they heal. Uh, but we have to make different kind of scaffolds now. We've got to make scaffolds. When we make bone scaffolds, they've got to resist uh, compressive loads and probably some torsional loads probably some bending loads, but the tendons have to resist tensile loads. It's a little different. Uh, our chemist team is working on it, and uh, we have to just make things a different way. There are different cells. There are fibroblasts that make collagen. Uh, and uh, this is just another thing that we're working on in a lab, and we're working on ways to hook the tendons to the bone, make bone tendon junctions. Uh, this is the work of uh, a postdoctoral fellow that was with us, Brett Rungi. We needed to make things that were tensile load-bearing. Brett uh, did his fellowship, works up for 3M now as a chemist. Uh, but he was able to make a, a copolymer uh, that uh, self-assembled into parallel strands. And so we're, we're starting slow. We have a lot of base work to do, but hopefully we'll have something for tendons. This is a, uh, the bone scaffold. This is the pores of the bone scaffold. And we take those parallel aligned tensile load-bearing elements put them in the pores, and, uh, and here's what we get. This uh, orange uh, or reddish pink stain is collagen. It's the, it's the tissue of tendons. The bone scaffold is that uh, thing beneath it, that bluish looking thing. And by putting them together and giving the, uh, the signals to make uh, collagen to the fibroblasts and giving the signals to make bone to the, to the bone, we at least get it where those two tissues are together uh, they interdigitate with each other, and we're hoping uh, that when we pull on the tendon, uh, when it's attached to the bone, that the, the uh, uh, disruption force is, is better than it is now when we just, what we do now for, I'm a guy that had my rotator cuff repaired, uh, get a few holes drilled in the, your humerus, pass the sutures through them, pull the tendon down into them, and hope and pray that it heals. Uh, hope, hopefully we can do a little better. And this shows that the uh, fibroblast attached to the uh, polymer and, uh, and you saw on the last slide the pink, they do make collagen. Let's talk about cartilage. Uh, degenerative joint disease, post-traumatic. Uh, this is post-traumatic is the young person who has normal cartilage and then something happens to them, car wreck, sports injury. And most of the joint has normal cartilage, but there's a little spot that doesn't. And uh, we know from decades of experience that if you don't fix that, that entire joint's gonna have arthritis in a person at a very young age. 
the clinical issues, if you got de uh, generalized arthritis, um, you know, 60, 70, uh, an artificial joint will last you your whole life. So when I talk about equipoise for people, let's say that somebody comes up with the perfect solution in animals for cartilage. I think uh, it would be inappropriate to say to somebody who has generalized arthritis, if I was the guy age 70 and someone came up to me and said, this cartilage works perfect, I'm going to give you cartilage like an 18-year-old. It's worked in every animal. And I'm thinking, hmm, one of my partners can spend an hour in the operating room, put a metal and plastic knee joint in me, and it's probably going to last me 20 years. There's no way I'm going to try something new. On the other hand, if I'm an 18-year-old who's got a pretty normal knee and I just got in a car wreck, and there's a chunk of cartilage out of that knee. All the things that we do, these are the current treatment options, they all make some cartilage in the hole, but none of them lasts. I might try that if I'm 18. If somebody tells me I got something in an animal, works perfect every time and lasts, and, and my other options are the current treatment options, I think there might be equipoise to suggest to me, why don't you try this new thing? And I might try that. I wouldn't try it as the first thing if I was the 70-year-old guy getting a total knee. Now let's see if this... Uh, Let's see if this, so we made this little cartoon to show what we think. Uh, this is a knee, heads up there. Uh, there's the, the end of the femur. There's this focal cartilage defect. Our thoughts are that we would put this injectable scaffold in and after preparing the defect of getting any loose pieces out, fill it in and then sculpt it uh, so that it matches and fits the surface. The light is to show that we start the polymerization with photo initiation. So it doesn't start getting hard as soon as we put it in. We have time to sculpt and move it around so just like we like it, and when we have it where we like it, it'll shine the light on it, it'll cross-link, and hopefully, you know, we'll see, this is in the future, but hopefully give somebody a better option. Muscles. Losing muscle uh, is a problem in trauma. Uh, the issues are the muscle, we talked about the tendon before, now we've got to talk about the muscle. The junction between the muscle and the tendon is hard to get. Also, muscles are innervated. The muscles, we got to get nerve supply to them to let them work. And again, it's, that, that means it's composite tissue regeneration. We need a muscle, we need a tendon, and we need a nerve that works. Now, here's a, here's a guy I took care of in Iraq. His head's, up, uh, his head's up this way. This is his thigh bone. There's his knee. Uh, you see this fellow that was assisting me put a sucker down. This guy had a high-velocity gunshot wound that went in the front of his thigh. Here's the end of that sucker. The exit wound was enormous. After we washed it out, you see that there's a, there's a big hole here. There's lots of tissue missing. This guy will do okay, but he's going to have difficulty straightening his knee out. He's missing a lot of his quadriceps muscle. Uh, volumetric muscle replacement uh, is, is a need. This happens not only in wars, but this happens in motor vehicle accidents, falls, etc. And skeletal muscle tissue engineering, there's two ways to do it. We either make the muscle outside the body and implant it, or in this case, the person themselves becomes the bioreactor. Now, here's another guy I took care of in Iraq. This talks about skin. It burns. Uh, this guy had 80% body surface area burn. Uh, when I started uh, as a surgeon, an 80% body surface area burn was pretty much uniformly fatal. Uh, the reason we have to make the cuts is the, the skin gets tight, the charred skin gets tight, and it will kill the uh, tissues under it. And the reason we have to do the chest is the chest gets tight. You know, when you breathe in, you expand your chest. They will not be able to breathe unless you make these cuts on them. Uh, but what are you going to do? How are you going to cover this guy? You've got to cover it. Now, this is from my colleague Steve Boyce at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, again, with respect to the military, there's a, a, a group uh, that was called the Armed Forces uh, Institute of Regenerative Medicine that occurred under the Bush administration and continues now. It's in, in about its 14th year now in the Obama administration. Uh, and it's got a bunch of us together. It turned what I would call uh, scientific competitors into friendly collaborators. We all shared what we were doing with others uh, and good things came out of it. Steve Boyce came up with this uh, polymeric uh, engineered skin substitute, which is a regenerative medicine technology. And little by little, they took what little cells he had left took those skin cells out, grew them on a polymer, uh, and then put them back in a little at a time. And if you look on the right, and yeah, he's got a lot of scars, but he's got pretty good skin coverage and he's gonna do okay. So regenerative medicine, remember, the era has started. We're, we're starting to do some things. Now nerves, 
current treatment options, direct neurography, fix a cut nerve, new neurotization, borrow a little bit of one nerve, give to another nerve. If you can't get the nerves to work, you transfer tendons to borrow from Peter to pay Paul. And the uh, sural nerve transplantation. The sural nerve is a sensory only nerve on the outside of your leg between the knee and, your, knee and the ankle. And it provides sensation to the lateral side of the ankle and the lateral side of the leg. And what the people give up is that they give up that sensation. They get a numb spot. And that nerve's transplanted to a, a nerve defect. Uh, we're going to use this, as I mentioned, I talk about equipoise. Uh, I, our group, who's here, does this together with Dr. Windebank's group, our neurology colleague. And uh, we are about to start the first inhuman use of the nerve uh, transplant grant. Now, here's what we can do with the polymers, though. On the left is a, a dorsal root ganglion cell. And you see that kind of tail that goes up the top. That's a neurite grown on the cell. On, on the polymer that we use, if we just have the polymer, that's what grows when we put that. Remember I said cells have to anchor to something to do their job. On the right, this was the work of Maruk Dotsitan, uh, she put some charge on the polymer. Look at how many, it's like a starburst. The, 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 the cells take signals. Just by having charge on the thing they attach to, they made many, many more nerve outgrowths, neurite outgrowths, than they did in an uncharged surface. This is one, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, we can we can tailor polymers to do specific things, and this is one example of that. Here's what one of the tube looks like. We can cross-section uh, cross cut longitudinally. We can make a single channel or multiple channels to guide nerves about uh, in the direction we want them. Now, I'll go into spinal cord. Uh, you see on the bottom here, 1550 BC, 3,500 years ago, pretty much says someone's got a neck injury, no sensation, arm and legs, unable to move them, and incontinent of the urine, let them go, uh, untreatable. No, we haven't come too far since then. We haven't fixed it yet, but uh, there, I think there's some hope. Uh, this is what happens. The spinal cord uh, gets a, a hit. That's a, a, down in the lower right, that's a picture of a neck fracture that's bumped the spinal cord. Cysts form. The, the circuitry is disrupted. And so what can we do? This is a model uh, that we do in, uh, in a rat. This is the spinal cord on the head side. This area is the gap where we cut a section of the spinal cord out. This is the spinal cord on the downside going down toward the legs. Uh, the green things are new filaments. So new nerve filaments have grown throughout that gap. And on the end, the new filaments go into the spinal cord. They go about a millimeter or two, and then they stop. They kind of curl, curly cue up. They, they don't keep going. And we thought, well, maybe that's just because it's, you know, the bottom uh, in that, that's, you know, this, this, this part of the spinal cord is still getting signals from the brain, and this one we've cut off. Maybe that's it. But then if you look up at, well, I didn't put the next slide in. I'm sorry. If you look up at the top, uh, they also grow there. So the ones from the, we've, we've done some tracing studies, the sensory uh, nerves from the bottom cross that first gap, enter the scaffold, that tube I showed you with the channels in it, cross the second gap, go for a millimeter two and stop. The motor nerve fibers begin at the top, cross that same top gap, but they don't stop. So it's not the gap. They cross it. They don't stop. They go all the way through the scaffold. They cross the next gap, uh, and then they go a few millimeters and they stop. So. Our current efforts are now asking questions with our uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Henley, who does uh, signaling uh, for neural tissues. And what makes them so? Why do they stop? Why, why do they get uh, enough signals to go by each other in that scaffold and cross the gaps and get into the normal cord, but then they stop? So these are the questions that have to be answered one at a time. Now, I'm going to show this, and then I'm going to stop and turn it over to Dr. Matsumoto. Uh, this is a, a model of a spine. We had a, a young man. This is a picture of his sacrum. It's separated here because it was separated in him. I'm not sure that I don't think that's me. It's not me. Thank you. Um, and you'll see little holes in it. What I was able to do because Dr. Matsumoto and her team made me a model. Uh, we met this young man. He, uh, he had been paralyzed uh, for a long time. And he got what's called a Charcot arthropathy, meaning he's insensate 
His uh, spine separated from his pelvis. It broke out his skin, and I met him with a, oh, about a six inch diameter ulcer just above his buttocks with his spine sticking out of it and infected. It took a number of operations to get it better with, again, a team. This is not any kind of surgery one person can do by themselves. Uh, but once we got the infection treated and we had to put him back together uh, so that he could sit in his wheelchair because he was floppy without it, I had no idea how I was going to do that. He had multiple operations. It wasn't normal anatomy. Dr. Matsumoto made this model, and we practiced the surgery on this model. That's one of the things you'll see what she does for us. We get models, and so by the time we go into surgery, we've been there already. We've gone through all this stuff. I knew exactly what I was going to do, where I was going to make the holes, and I put this on a little table next to the operating table so I could refer to it as we went on. Now, another male story before I go. World War II, uh, pilots started to die. And when the aircraft accident investigation happened, the planes looked completely functional. People were wondering what was going on. But during the war, uh, both for the uh, Axis and the Allies, jet airplanes came into play. No one had understood before that there was going to be this new thing. Remember I said with, with us, no matter how much we do it in animals, we put something in per person, something's different. Uh, with the planes, no matter how much they tested them, G-induced loss of consciousness, G-lock from G-forces, wasn't recognized until people started dying. Um, they came to Mayo uh, and asked them to look into it. Um, three things came out of this. Uh, the pilot's uh, suit, the G-suit, that's pretty much the same today uh, as it was when they made it here in the 1940s. The bailout bottle uh, that you see there, if they have to I remember it, when, you, when you get in an airplane that goes over about 10,000 feet, they pressurize it because the natural thinning of the oxygen at that level, you start to not be able to breathe in a little more than that, and it's not okay to breathe at all without oxygen. Uh, and so if you parachute out of a plane above that, you can die on the way down because there's no oxygen. The bailout bottle was for that so that you could use the oxygen through the face mask. And this uh, Boothby Lovelace Benson face mask that was made in the 1940s is essentially the same face mask functionally as pilots use today. Uh, so how did this all happen? This is experimentation. And the message here is a lot of times when, when we do experimentation for one thing, it really helps in a lot of other things. And such was the case here. Uh, this is Earl Wood. Earl Wood was a young man. This is the first human centrifuge made in the United States. Um, it was made in the two blocks down from here, the Medical Sciences Building. And the, uh, uh, the tracks in the floor, it's a storeroom now, the tracks in the floor are still there. Uh, this uh, was on, on the display at the airport for the longest time, and then it was taken down. Uh, so what happens? Look at him on the left here. He's sitting back, and his idea was to, to pass out, you've got to have loss of blood flow to your head, and maybe if you can move your head a little lower to your heart, that vertical distance that the heart has to pump will be less, it may be protective. Well, that was true. And if you look at any fighter aircraft today, they all lean back, and none of them sit up, none of them sit up straight. Um, and here's Earl Wood. He, he was his own uh, subject. And if you look from the left to the right, you see a guy that's pretty much with the rope program, maybe looking a little apprehensive. But he gets sleepier and sleepier. And then in the middle, he's asleep. He's gone. He's, he's unconscious. And on the right, he wakes up and he's got that what happened look. He's still not quite with it. Uh, and there he was. He, he died a few years ago at age 97. And uh, he gave us a lecture. I was privileged to sit and listen to his lecture on this whole sequence uh, before he passed away. Uh, and he said to us, I have probably lost consciousness because of lack of oxygen in my brain more than any human being in history. And I made it to 97 with my faculties <laughs> intact. And so uh, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, here's the team. Uh, I have the privilege of speaking to you. The team does all the work. I'm going to thank you for listening and ask Dr. Matsumoto to come and show us some of her things. Thanks very much. Jane, I'm going to get out of the way. Oh, I'll just take a few minutes. Hi, I'm Dr. Matsumoto. Would you, like, would you like to? Shall I give her one of these? Can I just stand by him and I can talk? <laughs> okay, that would be great. May I? Um, oh, give yeah, me. thank you. I'll help you. Thank you very much. Can I give you this in your pocket? No, but I'll carry it. Um, so I'm Dr. Matsumoto, and I um, help direct the uh, 3D anatomic modeling lab in radiology. 
with Dr. Morris. And, and like Dr. Yazemski, I'm part of a team. So I'm part of a team of about 20 people that do this work, and I'm just coming to show you. And we're very privileged to work with Dr. Yazemski in his lab. And even though what we do is a, little, is a little bit different, I think as future goes on, it will merge. So if you have time when you're done, come up here. Here are some of the things we do. We take high-resolution CT and MR images of individual patients that are having complex surgery. The surgeons come and say, this is a very complex case. Could you make a 3D model? And why do you make a 3D model? Don't you have all those images on the computer? You do, and you can even reconfigure them. But like you all know, there's nothing like having the real thing in front of you. There's one thing to have a 2D image, a 2D picture of a person, a 2D picture of a bike, but to have them in front of you, to hold them, it, your brain just comprehends it so much better, you understand it. So I'll just show you a couple examples of these, and these are ones that, and our surgeons don't do anything unless it helps them. So when they come and they say, this helps me, can you do this? Then we say, yes, we can try to do that. Um, and they come back and they say, that really helped, now this time can you do this? So it's a very collaborative experience for us. We work with the surgeons. They tell us this is what we'd like, and we say, okay, we'll try to do that, and then they come back to us. So, um, it's, and it's the most gratifying thing for us when they come back to the lab and say, that really helped, that really made a difference. It shortened the time up, it, it focused the exam, because there's a lot of complex things going on, like the patients that Dr. Yazemski showed you, a lot of decisions to be made. And if you can make some of those before surgery, before they're under anesthesia, you already kind of know um, that really helps. And I'll have to tell you one story about all the surgeons because it's really interesting for us. So we make these models. Here's a patient with a renal tumor, and here's a patient with anomalies of their spine, and it doesn't make, you know, we make cardiac models, we make lung tumors, renal tumors, spines, hands, wrists. And when you take these models and the surgeons come, they're talking to you, you hand the models to the surgeons like that. The surgeons start talking to the model. They just <laughs> they say, oh, I'm going to come here. I'm going to, oh, it's oh, now I know this and this. And, and then they walk off down the hall to show their surgical friends, and you're just like, oh. <laughs> but they all do it, hands down. So you can just see, and I think especially with surgeons even more than other people, you know, their hands are, the neurons connecting their brains and their hands are just really vibrant. So you give them this, and there just must be this circuits just going and fire. But so... So when you have time, please come up and see them, because we, we're doing more and more. I think this is just the advent. I, I'll have to say, we started off about eight years ago, and we started off with conjoined twins. And you probably have heard the stories of the conjoined twins at Mayo. There is nothing more complex than a set of newborn babies joined at differing parts of their bodies. And, and even though you can do all the CT MRs you want, it made such a huge difference to Dr. Moyer and his surgical team to have the life-size models of those twins to look at, to think about, to practice, to rehearse, you know, and, and as a focal point for the surgical team. So the surgical team could all be looking at the same thing and, and also for the families, you know, to understand. Um, it's one thing to look you know, at the 2D image or have the surgeon draw it, but if you show the patient, you know, this is your kidney, this is that tumor, this is what we're gonna do for everybody you understand more. So it's really been, I think, an advance. Um, Dr. Stans in pediatric orthopedics, who's been one of the early users, just says it's the next step in helping the surgeons do the best surgery with the most safety, with the best outcome. So please, when you have a minute at the end, come up. There's um, a lot of different models just to get an idea of, of what's there. So thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so these are physical models. But when you've already got it in a computerized 3D model, can't they also go through and actually make cuts and see what would happen if they remove this? They can, and they do that. They can do that in there. They can make cuts. But you know what helps them the most is if we take the cuts they make and we make a physical model of those cuts, right, because it it um, just to, again to have it in your hand to rotate it. Because you know human bodies are not squares or circles. They're all these curves and linear relationships. So. It, to have that model in your hand, it just, um, it, the comprehension is just so much greater. So they like to do that. They like to take the models and saw them and, and themselves actually. Sometimes they do it on the screen and sometimes the material is such that they can practice doing it, you know, outside too.
Has 3D printing added any opportunities to you for making models, or are they all molded, or how do you go about making models? Well, we use 3D printers, so we don't, um, we can make molds, but we also have a printer, so we take the um, high resolution. The other thing that's happened is that MR and CT data has become such high resolution in the last 10 years that we take that and we put it in software and then we bring it and we segment out and that means we take the anatomy that's of interest to the surgeon. So you can't put all the anatomy on your model so you can't tell anything. But we'll like ask Dr. Zemsky, what do you want to see? And he'll tell us. We'll segment out that part of the anatomy and then with the software we have, we convert that into what's called an STL file. They're just different kind of files, and we put that on the printer. So all of these were printed on a printer, and if you haven't seen it, it's really interesting. It lays down this thin polymer. Ours is like high resolution, it's 30 microns, and it has a UV light that hardens it as it's laid down, and that does it. Whoever thought of this is a genius, but you're just like, who thought of this? But it's like a, you know, a laser printer for paper, layer after layer after layer after layer. So this, to make this was like thousands of layers, but each layer, they get the data from the CT or MR that we fed into it, and it prints this. So all of these are 3D printed. And I think you're going to see that more and more. And right now, we make things that aren't implanted. We just make them for guides. But I can see someday that we're 3D printing things for Dr. Yazemski, that he then takes those files, and he develops a scaffold from individualized 3D printing that we've done of patients. Years ago, I saw that you were doing scaffolding from, from printed data. Are you still, so you're still doing that? We do. And that's how you make the scaffold? Correct. Our, our lab has a, a variety of uh, solid freeform fabrication, uh, i.e. 3D printing capabilities. Each one has a little different flavor, uh, and we pick the one for whatever reason we think will be best uh, used in any specific application. Other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.